What's going on guys? Welcome back. And today I am going to be starting a new film review series. Now I like to do these every once in a while in anticipation of an upcoming film which is a part of one of my favorite franchises. Last year I did this for the Wizarding World franchise leading up to the release of Fantastic Beasts The Secrets of Dumbledore. And that was a very ambitious project, a type of project which I will not be attempting again. Don't get me wrong, I am happy with how that series turned out, and I'm glad I did it, but I put a lot of pressure on myself to get those videos out once every week, and there were 11 films to cover there. Thankfully, I only have 6 films to cover this time over the course of 6 months, because in just under 6 months, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 will be releasing, and I figured what better time to talk about the Mission Impossible franchise, because I have talked about it very briefly in videos in the past, but I've never really gone in depth on what I think about the Mission Impossible films, because I do enjoy them overall. I think that they have their ups and downs, but as far as ongoing blockbuster franchises are concerned, it's one of the better ones. So today I will be beginning this series with Mission Impossible from 1996. Starting off, I'll talk about the things I like in this film, because I do think it is solid overall while being far from the best this franchise has to offer. Firstly, the decision to open the film on John Voight's character is a fun subversion, because it leads you to believe that he will be the titular character, while of course Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt is the real protagonist, and John Voight plays the role of the antagonist by the end of the film. They also introduce you to this band of characters with strong camaraderie who are incredibly confident in their abilities, which makes it all the more shocking when everything goes horribly wrong and the entire team dies within the first 20 minutes of the film. It sets a far different tone than what you were expecting, a tone that the rest of the film doesn't fully maintain, but we'll get back to that later. There are some excellent sequences of suspense in this film. One is towards the beginning once Ethan's team has been killed and he meets up with Kittredge in a restaurant where he slowly comes to the realization that the rest of the IMF have turned on him and believe him to be the mole thereafter. There is an excellent buildup of intensity during this scene which is complemented by Danny Elfman's score and a standout facial performance from Tom Cruise. It all comes to an explosive finale as Ethan blows up the fish tank in order to escape. The iconic Langley heist is also a very tension-filled scene as Ethan hangs from a rope, trying not to trigger the alarm as he extracts some crucial information. The scene is slightly undermined for me by the overly goofy character of Franz Krieger, but once again, I'll get back to that later in this review. I also think the film comes together pretty well by the end. The twist that John Voight was the real mole within the IMF is well executed, in my opinion. There are small details which come full circle, such as the knife Ethan finds being used to kill one of his teammates being the same knife which belongs to Franz Krieger, tipping Ethan off to the fact that he was also hired by John Voight's character. The finale is pretty fun. There is some noticeable green screen, but it does feel like a neatly wrapped package, which I can't quite say about the next film in this series. I guess I'll move on to the aspects of this film that I'm more mixed on. One of them being the score by Danny Elfman, which works well at points, but not at others. It doesn't have the same fun or energetic feeling as Michael Giacchino's scores for the third and fourth films, or the epic and bombastic score that Lauren Balfe composed for the sixth one, which you may say is the intention. This film is a more grounded spy thriller rather than being the more crowd-pleasing action films that the later installments in the series are. But despite that, I feel similarly to the film itself, 
the score is slightly inconsistent in its tone. Tom Cruise's performance in this film is also inconsistent in quality, but I like the stark contrast between him here and the character he is far later in the series. At the beginning of this film, he is all about the mission. Once his team starts dying off, the one thing he focuses on is retrieving this vital piece of information. But by the beginning of the sixth film, he's willing to give up a plutonium core, essentially a nuclear bomb, in order to save his friend. It shows that he becomes a more compassionate character as the series goes on. And as previously stated, there are moments in this film where Cruz showcases his acting chops. The aforementioned restaurant scene, or the one prior to that in a phone booth where he's freaking out over the phone to Kittredge, obviously being severely traumatized by the loss of his entire team. But then he's dropping one-liners with Ving Rhames 30 minutes later, and it's kind of jarring. Ethan remains... A consistently serious character for much of this series, but especially in these first two films, it feels like they were really trying to figure out who they wanted the character of Ethan Hunt to be. They wanted him to be this tortured soul who's traumatized by the loss of his friends, but he's also meant to be the fun, charming, likable action movie protagonist. They couldn't quite strike that balance. And I think they achieve that effect far better in the later films in this franchise. That creates a nice segue into what I'm more critical of about this film. As I said, it really feels like they were trying to figure out who they wanted Ethan Hunt's character to be. And the same can be said about the film. It feels like they were trying to figure out what they wanted this franchise to be. They were finding their footing with this film, and you can tell, because the tone is confused. It begins with this dark scene of the entire team being murdered in brutal ways, and from then on you think it will be a darker spy thriller, but then you have scenes of Ethan Hunt and Luther Stickle cracking jokes, and the overly goofy Russian character of Franz Krieger. This character is meant to fill the role of the dumb brute stereotype, but he's also supposed to be intimidating because he's untrustworthy and as we find out, he's in cahoots with the main villain, but I could never take him seriously. I found every single one of his scenes in this film to be hilarious and not for the right reasons. I understand what they were trying to go for with his character, showing that Ethan is a more thoughtful and inventive character, while Krieger is more impulsive and brash, but if you ask me, this idea was executed far better later on in Fallout with Henry Cavill's character. There are also a few moments in this film where it feels like they didn't trust the audience to infer some crucial pieces of information without reminding us of them. For example, towards the beginning of the film, in the aforementioned restaurant scene, Kittredge tells Ethan about a contact they have called Max. In the scene directly following this one, Ethan starts looking on the computer for this contact, and for some reason they decide to replay the line of dialogue from Kittredge where he talks about this contact because you know, we as the audience wouldn't be able to remember what had been said in the scene directly prior to this one. There is another instance of this later in the film during the scene where Ethan realizes Jim Phelps is the mole. He's looking at the Bible he's been using to communicate with Max throughout the entire film and realizes that it belongs to the Drake Hotel in Chicago, which is where Jim said he was residing at the beginning of the film. This is more excusable to me, because unlike the previous example, they weren't reminding us of something that had been said in the scene that happened literally right before this one, but I still would have respected the filmmakers more had they trusted us to figure it out on our own, but instead, 
they thought we were too dumb to pick up on the subtleties of their story. You can also tell they were still on the fence about how ambitious of stunts they actually wanted Tom Cruise to pull off, so this film is much smaller in scale as opposed to the later films in this franchise where he's literally motorcycling off of cliffs or jumping out of planes, which is fine. But I do think the third act is a little too reliant on green screen. It is conceptually an exciting finale, and it's entertaining to watch, but it hasn't aged particularly well. Yet again, it is a film from 1996, so I don't know what I was expecting. That's about all I have to say about the first Mission Impossible film. It is a decent movie with some very strong elements, and some weaker ones. I will admit I don't remember having super fond memories of this film, so I was pleasantly surprised to see how well most of it does hold up. As I said at the beginning of this video, I will be reviewing these films every month until July when Dead Reckoning comes out, so be expecting my review of Mission Impossible 2 sometime in March. You guys let me know, what are your thoughts on Mission Impossible from 1996? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Just whatever your thoughts are, please let me know them all in the comments below. And of course, as always, I hope you guys have a great day. Take care. Bye.